Welcome to On the Same Page. I'm Tommy Sanders. Today's book is The Brief History of the Dead. It's written by Little Rock resident, Little Rock writer Kevin Brockmeyer. It is a national bestseller. It's a story, a narrative about two worlds, the world of the living, 30, 40 years in the future, and the world of the living dead, or people who have departed this earth but still exist in the memories of those who live here on earth. And a strange intersection of these two worlds provides the background for this book. Kane Webb is set to interview our author right now, Kevin Brockmeyer. After that, we'll come back and discuss the book with our Arkansas readers. So, hope you enjoy The Brief History of the Dead. It's now in paperback, The Brief History of the Dead by Little Rock's own Kevin Brockmeyer, and the book is as uh, compelling as the title. Kevin, thanks for joining us sure, here I'm at Lorenzo's Bookstore. Uh, and thanks for writing this remarkable book, Thank which you. is uh, about life and death and afterlife and after death, and I couldn't put it down. So Thank, Thank you. you very much. And I'll ask you what everyone asks me when I recommend a book. What's it about? Well, The Brief History of the Dead takes place in, it has two separate storylines. Um, one of those stories tells the story of a, a woman named Laura Bird, um, who is isolated in the Antarctic and slowly discovers that a calamity has befallen the rest of the human race. Um, and the other section of the book takes place in a city of the dead but not yet forgotten. Um, this is a place where those of us who have passed away but have not yet slipped out of living memory um, continue to exist until uh, everyone who remembers encountering us has also passed on, at which point we move on to whatever might come next. Which we don't know. Which we don't know. Yeah. And how did you get the idea for this? It, it, I mean, it, these two themes have been, or familiar themes, life mm -hmm. after death and uh, essentially being almost the last person on earth, yeah. but uh, two pretty heady subjects to link together. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, um, there's an epigraph in the novel, and it comes from a nonfiction book called Lies My Teacher Told Me by James Lewin, uh -huh. which is about how poorly history is taught in American high schools. And late in the book, he just mentions in passing this African notion of the three terrains of existence, the living, um, what he calls the Sasha, and what he calls the Zamani. And the Sasha are what I was talking about earlier, the, the dead who have not yet passed out of living memory. And the Zamani are the more distant dead, um, who have been forgotten by those who are still alive. Um, and uh, you know, he mentions this idea very briefly, and it's just a way to introduce um, the idea of the importance of incorporating the testimony of people who lived through recent history mm -hmm. into the high school curriculum. And then he moves on to talk about other things. Um, and it's a great book, but that particular notion struck me as really intriguing, uh -huh. um, and it kind of remained in my head for several years, and eventually I decided that it would make a good kernel for an extended piece of fiction. And the city of the dead that mm -hmm. you described isn't like some sort of purgatory of clouds and you know weirdness. It, it's no. an actual city. Although I, mean, I, I like that phrase, a purgatory <laughs> of clouds and weirdness. <laughs> well, you know, I'm Catholic. We've done away with limbo now, so all we've got it's is purgatory. Heard, yeah. so. yeah. But it, it, it's um, an actual city. No, it's an actual <coughs> city, and uh, it, it, it's... Um, uh, the landscape is constantly changing in small ways, um, and it's not identical to any city you might have encountered here uh -huh. on Earth. But my notion when I was writing those sections of the book was that it would be a city that was basically a city of all cities. You know, it, it was kind of made up of the cities that everybody who inhabited it um, remembered from their own experience mm -hmm. on Earth. Um, uh, you know, the, the book doesn't necessitate that interpretation of the city, but that's what was in my head when I was writing it. So you had, like you said, these two storylines. You've got the city of the dead and the mm -hmm. mysteries that are going on there and the vignettes of the people there. And you've got the story of Laura Bird, who's yes. a biologist uh, on an expedition in Antarctica. And a virus has wiped out most of the world, yes. probably all of it except for her and her survival. Mm -hmm. And it al alternates by chapter. Yes. Um, and I was curious, how did you write the book? Did you write Laura Bird, City of the Dead, Laura Bird? Or did you, how what was the process like? Well, um, I began with chapter one, and I, I tried to structure that chapter 
as a self-contained short story, even though I knew it was going to be the first chapter of a novel. Um, and there are several reasons for that. One of them is that it's just easier to, psychologically, easier to embark on a short story than it is on the yeah. novel. Um, and if you've got a first chapter that's a good short story and the novel falls apart on you at some point, at least you got a good short story <laughs> out of the deal. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, aside from that, I wrote the first chapter, and then I wrote all of the even-numbered chapters, all of the Laura Bird chapters, mm -hmm. exploring her experiences in the Antarctic. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, her narrative I is almost like uh, a novella of sorts. Um, you know, it, it, it maintains a single point of view, and I was afraid that if I abandoned that point of view periodically to explore what was happening in the city, I would lose something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, 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 would, I would forget how it worked, something like that. Um, so I just decided to stay with it. Um, and then after that, I went back in and filled all of the odd-numbered chapters in. The, there's an, uh, one uh, kind of unexpected character, I guess you could call in this book. Coca-Cola keeps popping up, I noticed. It does. It's the, uh, the company that uh, sponsored the expedition. Yes. Why, what's your fascination with Coke? And well, I'm really <laughs> curious, did you ever hear from any corporate suits at Coca-Cola? You, Coca -Cola? Would, you <laughs> wouldn't believe how many people have asked me about that. <laughs> Everywhere I go, people want to know if I've gotten in trouble with Coca-Cola. And I haven't heard from anybody at Coca-Cola, uh -huh. and I presume that the legal department at Random House took any steps they felt they needed to take to ensure yeah. that this book wouldn't uh, uh, you wouldn't get under the skin of the Coca-Cola Corporation. Yeah. But you know, you're in your um, you're in your own home in solitude, writing a piece of fiction, and it never occurs to you that you know anything you write could possibly um, offend you know yeah. uh, you know the great and mighty <laughs> Coca Cola who, you know who could squash me like a bug if they chose to um, but this is clearly a work of of fantasy mm -hmm. in some ways I mean I, I hope it's a work of literary fiction but it's got a strong element of the fantastic to it um, and so I don't think anybody could read the book and presume that the actions taken by the Coca Cola Corporation in the book um, which aren't venomous actions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, they're just, they're inept in some ways, mm -hmm. um, but they're not, they're not malevolent. Um, I don't think anybody could presume that those actions are intended to disparage the real Coca-Cola Corporation. Um, the book has been published in a few other countries, though, and some of them have very different libel laws, and so there are some unusual ornate disclaimers on various copyright oh, pages, right? yeah, about, you know, I don't intend to disparage Coca-Cola, and they've never yeah. done anything like this. And, and it's also a Coca-Cola of, of the future. I mean, it this, is. This, mo it this is. book is set I'm not quite sure when, but in the dis not too distant future. That's, I guess. That was my intent. Yeah, kind yeah. of the middle years of, of this century. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, I, I wanted, I needed to find a way. Again, something you learn very early in the book is that um, uh, a virus is responsible for um, damaging the human mm -hmm. population, and uh, I wanted to find uh, a unique way of disseminating that virus, and one that seemed not implausible to mm -hmm. me. And I thought that a consumer product might be uh, the best avenue to follow. I hadn't seen it done before, and it, it was it, it was interesting to me. And it occurred to me that I could I could invent a consumer product, but every time I decided to do it, it just rang false on the page. Yeah. It just seemed silly to me. Yeah. Um, so I ended up deciding on Coca-Cola because it's the most widely distributed consumer product in the world, um, and because linguistically, I thought it 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 had an advantage that no other consumer product does. Um, and that's that when you use a product name in a piece of fiction of the type that I was trying to write, um, uh, those words can have, I think, a deleterious effect on the rest of the language often. Um, they just, because they're words that are designed to sell you something mm -hmm. in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And when they appear suddenly in the middle of a sentence that's trying to, estab to establish a certain atmosphere, they can kind of tear it apart from the inside because they're, 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 uh, you know, they're words that we're used to using in different ways, and they're designed to have a different effect. Um, but Coke and Coca-Cola is such a widely used term, and in fact, it's even a generic term in some regions of the country, like uh, Little Rock. Yeah. You, know, you can oh, step sure. into a restaurant Coke. here and what order a want? Coke. Yeah, which, which, would you, which do you want? Yeah. Do you want Coke, uh, Sprite, Dr. Pepper, yeah. um, Orange Soda? You know, they're all Coke. <laughs> That's right. So it, it felt like a good generic, almost a good generic term that would fit neatly into the atmosphere of the sentences as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I'll, I'll cap that answer off by saying that you know I have no animosity toward the Coca-Cola <laughs> Corporation, and, and, uh, and I, my favorite beverage is probably ginger ale, and uh, I drink Schweppes, which is a Coca-Cola brand, all the time. So, yeah. Well, yeah. Coke makes an interesting character in the in the in the book. Not as not as interesting as my favorite, which was Luca, the old newspaper man, yeah. who's in the City of the Dead, and he's a lot of times he speaks in headlines, which which I just love. Mm -hmm. And I thought you, you, being an old newspaper man myself, I thought you really kind of nailed the inky wretch uh, that he was at one point, and I guess still is, because he puts out a, a little newspaper in, he does. in the after He does, world. and that newspaper becomes more and more important to the people yeah. who live there as the story progresses. Is he based on anyone that, that you know, or did you just kind of no, he create isn't. him um, I, I swiped the name from somebody I knew. I, I've uh, a couple friends whose first child is Lucas Sims, and I uh -huh. asked them if I could borrow the name for the book. Um, but otherwise, no. I mean, the character is just, um, like most of my characters, a combination of bits and pieces of my own personality, of the mm -hmm. personalities of people I've known, of people I've read about, of people I've seen in movies, and then just things I've invented whole cloth. It's kind of a fun parlor game, too, for those of us in central Arkansas to look for references to places and people we know, like yeah. La, La Hacienda Restaurant. Yeah. Pizza the Action, yeah. Lyndall Trimble, Lindell who Trimble. was, you said, accidentally named Lyndall Trimble. That's uh, right, yeah, you know, um, <coughs> if, if Lyndall Trimble is watching, <laughs> I'd like to apologize to him for, for accidentally naming what is perhaps the least sympathetic character <laughs> in the book after him, but it, it was not deliberate. My dad's uh, middle name is Lyndall, and my mom used to work for a law firm, Bailey Trimble, Pinson and Sellers, and I put Lyndall together with Trimble, and it just sounded right to me. It does have a ring to it. It does have a ring to it, and it wasn't until maybe a week before the book hit the shelves that I realized the reason it sounded so good was because there's a Lyndall Trimble in central Arkansas, and I was used to seeing him on commercials and things like that. Yeah. Uh, you attended and taught at Iowa Writers I did. Workshop, famous uh, creative writing school. What was that experience like, and how did it change you as a writer? More than anything else, it it uh, you know it gave me the time to turn myself into a working writer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, allowed me to figure out how to structure a day just around writing when nothing else was involved. I think it was a great place for me to be. Um, I was involved with a lot of other um, dedicated writers who mm -hmm. were working in. Uh, very different ways, but who nonetheless were capable of responding to what I was doing. And in some ways, those people are still the audience for some of my fiction. Yeah. You know, I, it's not as if I send it to them soliciting their advice or anything like that, but uh, it's not unusual for me to think about the response that a piece of writing might elicit from those particular readers yeah. when I sit down to work. You've written uh, children's novels before. You say I you've have. got, you're working on one now? Or I you, am, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, yeah, you know, the, the last book I finished is a story collection, and that'll uh -huh. be out um, early 2008. What's the title for that? The title is The View from the Seventh Layer. Which was uh, a story a that was in the Oxford American. American. That's right, yep. With the widow Lorenzen. Yes, with We're the widow Lorenzen. Th that's right, yeah. we're here in Lorenzen and Company. Um, and the, uh, you know, and I try to follow every book for adults up with a book for children. That's okay. just how I structure my writing. Do you think life, you'll so. keep doing that? You enjoy if the, I can, the yeah. Back and yeah, forth? yeah. They kind of exercise different areas of my uh, imagination, and so it's nice to be able to turn from the one to the other. I would like you, if you would, to read us a passage sure. from the brief history of the dead. Okay. Um, this is midway through the first chapter of the book. Occasionally, one of the dead, someone who had just completed the crossing, would mistake the city for heaven. It was a misunderstanding that never persisted for long. What kind of heaven had the blasting sound of garbage trucks in the morning, and chewing gum on the pavement, and the smell of fish rotting by the river? What kind of hell, for that matter, had bakeries in dogwood trees, and perfect blue days that made the hairs on the back of your neck rise on end? No, the city was not heaven, and it was not hell, and it certainly was not the world. It stood to reason, then, that it had to be something else. More and more people came to adopt the theory that it was an extension of life itself, a sort of outer room, and that they would remain there only so long as they endured in living memory. When the last person who had actually known them died, they would pass over into whatever came next. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks I enjoyed it. Thanks for writing this, this novel. I appreciate it. Kevin Brockmeyer. Thank you.
I hope you enjoyed that. That's uh, Kane Webb interviewing Kevin Brockmeyer, the author of The Brief History of the Dead, today's subject on On the Same Page. I'm Tommy Sanders, and now's the time when we talk to our Arkansas readers about what they thought about the book. I'm happy to introduce them to you today. They are Judy Goss, who is a drama teacher at the Parkview Arts and Arts and Science Magnet High right, School. I'm right. going to get the name yeah. right. Here in Little Rock, and also from Little Rock, John Sykes is the chief photographer for the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. Thank you all for being Thank here. You. We'll plunge into it in just a second. Here for everyone who's joining us late. Let's talk about the book really quickly, The Brief History of the Dead by Kevin Brockmeyer, a Little Rock, Arkansas native and resident here. A book about two worlds, the world of the living and the world of the dead. The world of the living, this world, uh, the story is set in mid-century, say 2050 or so, and the world is uh, undergoing a, a pandemic, almost comprehensive pandemic. The population is dying off. There may only be one person left on Earth, and that is one of the central characters of the book. The other world, the world of the living dead, where people who pass from this world go, a city in fact, where you may reside, not too different from this world, until your memory in the mind of someone living on our Earth is gone and then you pass to somewhere or nowhere. We don't know. But uh, there being only one person left on Earth, you can see the pivot point of the story. So a very, very interesting, unique concept for the book. Very, very enjoyable. And I, I don't know if I've described it. Maybe you can add to that or subtract to that, Judy. What would you say? Well, it is, it is all of that. And okay. as Kevin explained, the chapters alternate between this adventure story and between this fantastic portrait of this imagined place that's not just a place, it is a state of being of some sort something that we're trying to imagine. And I encountered this first as the short story in The New Yorker, mm -hmm. published in 2003, and it compelled me completely. I didn't know what was going to come after it. I knew it was a good jumping off place for a great adventure story, but to me it had the heart and some of the thematic elements that I've seen in Kevin's other short stories and other novels too, and maybe we can talk about those in a minute. Sure. But I was totally taken in by the first chapter. As which that appeared early, in the New Yorker. Which appeared in the New Yorker as that short story. Celebrated short story, an award-winning yes. short story. And as I recall, the first chapter dealt mainly with a lot of the personalities of the people who had crossed from the world of the living into the, the city of the living dead. And, is, 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 is my, and that self-contained, as it was, was chapter one of this book. Um, the book deals with a lot of themes, one of the themes, uh, one that people have always fantasized about since the beginning of time, I imagine, is the, the prospect of being the last living person on right. Earth. Uh, John, what did you think of how, it, how that subject was treated in this book? Well, I, I felt it was a very realistic treatment of it because you instantly recognize the world that these people are in. It's, it's uh, easy to see yourself in that situation, and that's what made it uh, more real for me. You like post, so-called post-apocalyptic sort right. of fiction, right? I do. It's right. a pretty good example in that genre. It is. It's it's uh, one of the best I've read. I think uh, it's it's poetic uh, in a sense. Uh, it, but it has the fantasy aspects, obviously, to it. But the real world, the world of the living, is very real and very scary. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> when you said it's yes. easy to see yourself in it, I thought uh, it's not easy for me to see myself in it because I would be terrified. You have those well, two worlds that, that, that are, are, as Kevin mentioned in the interview, right. they are chapter for chapter, right. one to the other right. to the other right. to the other. Alternating. Which of the two worlds would you prefer to live in <laughs> if you could choose oh, one of the two worlds in this book? The living dead for me. The living dead for you. You <laughs> like that? You like yeah, that better? I, I, don't, I don't see any, uh, any attraction for... Uh, for the living world there at well, this point. Well, pretty tough circumstances right. in, in this world. Right. At the end, the story of, of Laura Bird, who was a, a researcher, as Kevin mentioned, in, in talking about the book on in, in the Antarctic, uh, who uh, has is sort of been abandoned uh, by her, her uh, compatriots there at the, at, the, at the research station and has to go in search of, of another station to see if there, there is anyone left right. and comes to the slow realization that there may not be anyone else left on earth. It's a, you know, it's a fantastic adventure, her is, journey I, across I the ice. So many readers could enjoy this if you look at how many people are interested in survival stories. Right. You know, and I don't just mean the hackneyed, you know, TV setups about, right. but people are concerned. I mean, you can get sure. drawn into it so much. And I felt, I was telling you before we started, I felt physically uh, afraid at, toward the end of, of her adventure. And of course, it, we're kept afloat with that hope because we do think, well, moment to moment, what can this person do next? What will they discover? If it's the inevitable, inevitable horrible thing, right. you know, we're crushed because we feel like we've been on that journey. But we, you know, if it's not, we're still hoping until we find that 
of what's going to happen to her. What frightened me about the book was, I think, the opposite of what scared you. I, the, the adventure part with her didn't frighten me as much as the description of the world that these ah, people yes. lived in. Like matter of factly mentioning uh, bombings and yes. the presence of people to watch out for um, viruses and epidemics and terrorism alert sirens right. on top yes. of every sirens building going and, off yeah. that they just ignored because they heard them all the time. That mm -hmm. was that was very scary to me. Oh, so absolutely! Surviving the uh, Antarctic. Absolutely. The author's invention of all these worlds, these, these mm. visions of the future, uh, obviously very inventive. The object, the, mm. the sub, the. Uh, product of a very creative mind. Well, and, and you, you, know, one you, of, one you of talk his, Kevin, one, so you, one you know talents, a little bit about that mind. You know, one of his talents is the talent of many fine writers, and that is to have so many details, especially sensory details, mm -hmm. that it's created very believably. So that there is, and that's why we read or go to the movies or anything else, is to step into a world we don't know, to be drawn into something new. And and he has believably, you know, created that. But I'd, I'd like to say that I, there's a lot of heart in it because this idea of memory and connection is not just a plot device. It is true that that's how long you're going to stay, but it also has a lot of heart in the individual stories that are revealed of the people who are the living dead. And so some of those memories are what you might say cliche. If the teenage boy remembers, you know, and he's obsessed to remember about his girlfriend uh, kissing his earlobe, well, we'd predict that. Okay, but then sure. there are other very unexpected random memories that these people have. And the idea of where is meaning in my life? What do these memories mean? And they're so fresh and they're so compelling, even if we're in the world of the living dead. It implies the importance of connection mm -hmm. uh, that you establish with other people and with your surroundings. It's and an and extended I have, family. It is. It is. And in fact, there's a line in it that mm -hmm. says something about the family you create here. Right. If your family isn't here, that's a that's a crude paraphrase. Mm -hmm. But that idea of connection and the opposite idea of loss, mm -hmm. and those are things that crop up, I think, very powerfully in some of Kevin's other writing. And to me, it makes this more than just an adventure story, but a story of the heart, stories mm -hmm. of the heart, because there are more There's, than one character who some, illustrate yeah, this. A lot of interesting too. characters that, that do that. Yeah, the, who was your favorite character, John, in, in, the, in the world of the, the City of the Living Dead? Well, I like the two guys, uh, I, I can't remember the names of the characters, but the two guys, uh, her compatriots. Who started out in the world right. of the living yes. and, and the, died the, in the Antarctic. The bickering the between them. I, 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 <laughs> really I do too. I, I'm with you I, on that. I, that was a funny couple of guys. I liked right the, that reminded me of people I know. Well, the <laughs> fact that you, you <laughs> step argue. off this earth having an argument right. with a guy and you pick up the argument the minute right. you yes. reappear and in the nice. next world yes. is kind of funny. They weren't seeking it out in the right. other world either. They just, they just came together and then they did the same things that yes. they did before. And you, to go back to what you said, you were talking about the uh, the memories that people yeah. had. And, you know, there was one, the, uh, the, the blind character talking mm -hmm. about some humiliations he had suffered. Mm -hmm. But some of the memories are so prosaic that, you know, the, the characters are like, you know, it's odd that I would remember, you know, yes. just some simple thing, which uh, that rang true yes. for me. You yes. remember the oddest, simplest, you know, banal things. And so what of your past can you keep? Right. Yeah. And so sometimes that is true. I think you're very right about it being psychologically true. And mm -hmm. it's one of my tests for mm -hmm. a good piece of fiction, be it short story or novel. Do I, do I believe it? Because mm -hmm. if I can believe it, then I'll go there, mm -hmm. too. You talked. You mentioned mm -hmm. when we first started talking about the importance of memory in this book mm -hmm. here. And, and do you see the author as someone who, like the rest of us, is, is very concerned with his connection to eternity, or do you think he's just he just wants to explore oh. a common fantasy that we all have? Oh my goodness, that's a big I, that's a big question. I you know because I had the uh, good fortune of teaching Kevin and seeing him emerge as a young writer, mm -hmm. um, that seems a pretty hefty thing on the plate about eternity. I think, I think but maybe I he know. said in interviews that he just wanted to explore one of these oh, common fantasies. Well, but he himself is a person of heart in my experience, and his memories are unpredictable, which makes him sure. fresh with them and fresh with the idea of memory, because that's fun if it's mm -hmm. unpredictable, and that allows you to play with it. And hey, how much do we know of memory? Mm -hmm. We know that a lot of memory is fabricated, 
our own memories or yeah, get, sure. get with one of your More family so members day. and remember something yeah, that happened. You know, happened that way. That's not right. the way I remembered it. So right. this idea of memory, but yet representing the importance of connection with other people, I think is very precious to the author and I think it's precious to most of us. Mm -hmm. And so sure. that's a connection that makes this come alive in a human way, mm -hmm. not just as a very artful story, which he is extremely artful and very careful in the way he constructs his work. Yeah. I know that to be true. Another mm -hmm. fantasy we all have is what it's like to die. I mean, we've all sat oh, and yes. thought about mm -hmm. And so much, so many of the rich passages, especially in this first chapter of the book, yes. are about the process of dying and crossing over. Did those sort of enchant you a little bit? Did right. You, were they, yeah. Did you find them well, compelling? The first chapter, I didn't know until after I'd read the book that it had been, it had been in, in the New Yorker. And uh, I thought it was a remarkable first chapter because it, it so fully gets you into the book. I didn't realize, you know, it, it was a bit, you know, first, you know, a, a separate thing. But uh, uh, the characters in this book are so, I'm trying to think of the word here, that are so ordinary to me, and that's uh, that's that's what separates this book from from so many other books of this type. They're not heroic you mean that necessarily. In a good way. Okay. Yes. 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 Yeah. Absolutely. You know they. She. You know the character Laura Bird uh, during the the end scene, the surreal end scene where she's in an office building and she can hear the the sounds of office work going mm -hmm, on. Mm -hmm. That you would remember that. Uh huh. You know and. Be, that be part of your fantasy world <laughs> as, yeah. as, as you die. Mm -hmm. Do you all see this as a possible launching place for a sequel, another book, backtrack in time, take some, a whole other group of people's stories and, and fit them into this, this plot line? Do you think that's, a, well, I was, I think I that's was, a worthwhile thing to pursue? Well, as the fan of post-apocalyptic books, I'm real curious about what was happening to the rest of the world. Oh. Yeah, it's a very unique book. Again, it's called The Brief History of the Dead. Kevin Brockmeyer, a Little Rock author, uh, New York Times bestseller. So certainly a, certainly a feather in a cap, certainly something you might want to check out. Regardless of what genre of, of fiction you like, this is, this is an interesting one right here. Judy Goss, John Sykes, thank you so much for thank all you. your insights. Enjoyed we enjoyed it. it. went very Correct. fast. And thank you for joining us on the same page.